Music has this character that it's alive only when it's played. Otherwise, it rests on the paper. And every time it's being made alive, it sounds different. Even if we want to repeat the same interpretation, what, God forbid, I hope no one wants, but uh, even if we try to, it will never be the same. You know, it happens in one moment and then it's gone. I would say music is all about listening. And music is like a form of engaging with other people by listening. And it doesn't mean if what end of the music making process you're on, whether you're uh, the, the instrumentalist, the singer, the audience, the composer, uh, the producer, whatever. It doesn't matter what role you play in it, but it's music is just a form of listening to one another. born in Be'er Sheva. It's in the south of Israel. It's actually in the desert. It's where the desert starts. I come from a family of five siblings and I'm the youngest. All my brothers and sisters actually played music. So by the time I came to, into the world, there were some instruments in the house like piano, accordion, recorders. At some point I, I expressed the wish to play music and learn, but actually I wanted to play the electric guitar. I was brought to the conservatory and uh, they said, you're too small, but we have a, a brilliant mandolin orchestra and uh, you know, it's similar, it has strings, you hold it like this. And I didn't even know what a mandolin was. I mean, the thought of a, like a small guitar and it sounded very sweet to me. My parents aren't professional musicians, they're both amateur musicians, but my four siblings and I, so I've got four younger siblings, um, we all grew up sort of making music, playing different instruments, um, and some of us have chosen to make it into a profession now. I first picked up a recorder. I mean, I probably picked it up before because we had, you know, various recorders of my mum's from when she was younger uh, flying around at home, so I must have sort of played around in them, but I don't want to know what it sounded like. <laughs> and I then first had lessons at the age of six when a family friend wanted to have lessons, but I think he was slightly scared of going by himself, so um, I went along. Um, I don't remember the exact first lesson I had, but the sort of general feeling of going there and playing music and having fun and going back home. I'm very thankful for my mother for all her support along the way because sometimes I had really crazy schedules for a, for a kid. I was kind of picked up from school, eating in the car to the next les lesson. And when I was younger, I also did some other kinds of art. I was uh, pottery and these kind of things. Yeah, I had, I had a busy, busy childhood with this kind of stuff. It was never boring. And uh, these are things that I'm today very, very thankful for. The sound of the recorder I would sort of describe as very sort of natural and very human because there is no barrier really between you and the instrument. Essentially it's I blow into the recorder 
and that creates a sound. So I think the recorder sound is very direct and very natural um, and very fragile as well, um, which sort of is also very human. <laughs> Everything you do will immediately affect what it sounds like. So if you're a bit nervous and you, your breath is a bit shaky, that will be audible. If uh, if you're a shy person, you blow less, then that will affect the sound. If you're very sort of bold or, you know, everything has a, immediately translates into a sound. The family of instruments that I play, that's the plucked instruments. The lutes, guitars, mandolins, etc. And I think there is something very fluid. It evaporates very quickly. You pluck a chord and it's there, but after a few seconds it's gone. What I love about the lutes especially is that you really pluck the strings with your bare fingers. So you're totally in contact with the instrument. I think of the string as, you know, like a being. It's a bit like a conductor asking his singers to sing. And as a lutenist you really have to, to treat your instrument well and all the things we do without thinking. Because we practice it for, for many years. But when you take a pause and start, you know, analyzing the, the small movements and all that, it's, it's actually fascinating. Alon and I, we crossed paths sort of online several times. I knew of what he was doing with um, his, his own group or groups, rather, and as a soloist, and probably the other way around as well. But we first met in person uh, in 2018. 2018 in Münster, actually, because uh, there's a, a festival there, um, Summer Winds. I remember that Tabea played a solo recital for a recorder, which is very unusual. I think it was the first uh, recital that I've heard on solo recorder without any accompaniment. And one thing that I also remember from that day that I heard her uh, practice, like kind of warm up before the concert, and uh, she was uh, doing some exercises that I've never heard on a recorder, like chromatical scales and things that maybe a violinist would do, but on the recorder it was like, wow. sounds familiar it's been a bit of a different process to what I usually do it all started when we were doing a different program sort of based around musical earworms and I would sort of asked Alan to come and join me for a performance and said is there anything you'd like to play that is sort of stuck in your mind at the moment sort of going round and round that you'd like to do and he said oh yeah I've got this um, Bach um, arrangement of a violin partita so we tried that and it was so much fun that we like at the end of the concert we came away thinking we should put this into a different program with sort of similar music or a music that's equally um, enjoyable and challenging to play. Um, and then we started talking about sort of composers, musicians associated with Bach, which is when the Weiss family uh, came in and then C.P.E. Bach as the son of uh, Johann Sebastian came into the mix and you know it sort of all sort of started developing from there so we didn't have a clear idea of, of the concept or the title at the beginning but it sort of came later on when we'd sort of made a big collection of, of pieces and we thought okay this is what we have what can we do with this what could this be what is the sort of story what's the connection and it turned out that it was sort of all sort of family tied. Sounds familiar because we looked for a title that has this family aspect in it but not too direct and obvious and sounds familiar I think it just sounds good. Sounds familiar, you, you might say, if you hear something on the radio and you go like, oh, that sounds familiar, I wonder what it is. And I think, or we think that um, with this program, we're sort of triggering that a little bit because there are some pieces in there that are actually quite well known, but in different, in a different guise. I 
would listen to the Biber Pasakalia either before I go to sleep, like to set me, to set the mind for this. Uh, it has something very mysterious in it. Um, it's highly emotional, but also, uh, so if it, was, if it was a picture, it was definitely foggy and with some rays of light shining in. Um, I think I would have wonderful dreams if I listened to it before going to sleep. But maybe also in a, in a kind of slow beginning in the morning, in a morning without stress, where you can put the CD or wherever people listen to music today with the first coffee of the day or something. I can imagine this CD playing in many different situations, in many different locations.